good evening, everybody. And thank you so very much to, to uh, Khaki for inviting me for this uh, discussion, talk and presentation and discussion. At the very beginning, I would like to pay my respects to Dr. Dixit, who is there with us uh, in the audience. Um, he was my PhD supervisor and converted me from a, a journalist trained in economics to a historian. So, so please maybe have you, would you, would you please be able to switch on your video for a minute? So thank you so much, sir. I am here because of you. So Guru Pranam, Guru Sakshat, <laughs> thank you. So this is the story of, uh, and also I'd like to pay, this show is dedicated to these two people who kind of emotionally handheld me, besides the academic handheld uh, handholding that I got from Prasad Dikshit. This is Aneta Nashinska. Both of these people are of course no more. And uh, she's a filmmaker and she covered the story and that's of course my late son. And I think it's, purely coincidental that this story is, uh, we are having this, this uh, presentation today at a date, which is very significant from two points of view. This is um, Polish uh, saga, the st saga that we're talking about, uh, started with the Soviet invasion of Poland on 17th of September. So today at 19th of September, we are very close to that uh, event and, and also that uh, it's also the week of uh, the birthday of mother mary the bandra festival which is I, I read in the newspapers that it is scheduled tomorrow so again from that pers perspective we are we are you know today's date is extremely significant uh, the outline of this presentation very briefly is going to be as it's on your screen uh, how they reached india the first base that in bombay then Briefly, other camps in India, the dispersal, the, monu uh, the memorial monuments, and the concerned people. So <clears throat> here we start again, start now. And uh, this map would, uh, is from the book written by General Wadislaw Anders. And this, we all know that the Second World War started with the invasion uh, of Poland by Germany on 1st of September. Somewhere, uh, it, is also, it is kind of swept under the carpet is that Russia too invaded Poland on 17th of September, 1979. So what happened then, there was actually a dual invasion. And uh, then, uh, of course, the, the, the army catapulted. And a whole lot of officers who were caught behind the lines, they, they were taken captives, POWs, and uh, what also happened is called the massacre of Katyn. 15,000 officers were uh, shot in the head. Uh, their hands were tied behind their back uh, with, a, with a string and they were shot. This was not discovered till very, very long. In fact, it was not even, a, you know, once the graves were discovered uh, during the Nuremberg trials, uh, uh, you know, it was, Germany said we have not done it and thereafter again went into a, a limbo. It was not until 1991 that Boris Yeltsin handed over the papers and that said that yes, it was actually a, a Russian act. And what followed thereafter, or about the same time, 10th of February, uh, 1940 onwards, were that the families uh, of these officers started getting deported into, in, uh, into Siberia and Kazakhstan. Uh, it, it was a very, very concerted move. Uh, they all went into these, they were literally thrown. It's not that they went very voluntarily. They were taken in these cattle trains and then they were thrown in these icy wastelands where they had to kind of fend for themselves. And there was very little food. And uh, Professor Norman Davis, the, the claimed uh, historian of Polish history. So he wrote that between the German policy of gassing people and the Russian policy 
of, of starving people, whether, whether average life expectancy was less than a year, who is to say which is better? And I'm quoting him entirely. It's not, I have not worked on this part of the story. So I've just taken it the way it is from established sources. And this is a map again from Jen Lander's book of where all people went. So here is Poland over here. This line is the bifurcation line, the, the line, uh, the molotov Ribbentrop Pact, uh, by which they had divided Poland along the river Boob. Uh, so this part was controlled by Germany and this part went in, was controlled by Russia and where all the deportation took place. And this is Katyn over here, Smolensk. And this is where, you know, the, all the families were, were spread. So after Operation Barbarossa, uh, then the, the, the Russians needed an army. So what to do? That's when, you know, this general was pulled out from Lubyanka prison, almost like a few days or weeks away from being uh, executed and uh, asked to raise an army. So they declared, an, and, and Russia declared an amnesty that, okay, you know, we are pardoning whatever war crimes that you, you have been arrested for, and now you guys can form an army. So once that, that news spread, uh, you know, these are very, you can see here, you know, Muramans, Archangels, and all these, no Novaya, Zamalia, the, the uh, Kotlas and things like, these are very, very cold places in Siberia, freezing cold, minus 40 degrees and all people actually started walking, you know, that there are, there are so many survivors testimonies which say that, you know, they just, you know, okay, the camps were, their doors were found open and they just started walking. Like, let's just walk south. And that's so, the army first collected up at this place called Guzluk, which is also quite cold actually. And then uh, they decided to move, uh, General Anders decided to move south to this place called Yangi Yul. Uh, warmer climate, but what happened the moment they started reaching this area is there are a whole lot of infectious uh, fevers started getting the people, typhus and dysentery and whatnot. And it was a very, very ragtag army and a lot of people died. In fact, uh, there are estimates which say that more people died over here than they died during that one and a half years that people were in, in Siberia. And definitely much, much more than the army casualties at Monte Cassino later on. So that, this is a, this was a very concerted thing. Uh, this movement, you know, of uh, the, the officers being sent somewhere and all the families being sent another, somewhere else is, is reflected through this um, postcard, which is, was sent to, this is, this is from the personal collection of Mr. Franek Herzog, who, who is, whose testimony forms a, a part of my book. So what I have done is I, I have done the historical research, the documents, etc., and the entire human interest part of it, the human experience part of it is, is given by, by uh, Franek. So this is all, of course, in Russian Cyrillic, and those who can read it, they would say, you know, this is, was his address in, in Poland. Where it was and it has been cut, and it is, so here you can see it says, the family has been moved to somewhere in Kazakhstan. And here, the sender's address is his father, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, F. Herzog, and he, he was in, in one of the POW camps, and there it has been crossed out, and it says somewhere like, moved to Sarian, which kind of coincides with with uh, with Katyn. This is General Anders. Um, so he collected his people and he has been, con you know, uh, called the Latter-day Moses, the way he, he got all his people together and he refused to leave the families, the women and children. And, uh, you know, he brought them all out, of, you know, he, he did not listen to the British uh, I mean, instructions of his own government or the British. And, you know, he just had the permission to move the soldiers, but he's, he brought everybody out. He said, I'm not going to leave anybody. I cannot expect my soldiers to perform if they don't, if they know that their families are not safe. 
and uh, there are no pictures from 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 Russia, but we do start getting pictures from Iran. The first, if, if we can just go back here, this is the the uh, movement that's taking place today from. Um, they all go from, from Yangi Yul, they all went somehow by train to this port called Krasnodarsk, and then by ship onwards, and they crossed over to Iran, which was then known as, as Persia. And of course, there, were, there was another route from here, from Ashkabad. Now, Ashkabad, this, is, this route was uh, penciled in by Stalin towards the end, and the children who reached India, uh, they, came, they took this day uh, from Ashkabad. So there were two exit routes out of Russia. One was uh, from Krasnodarsk by sea to Pahlavi in, uh, in Iran. And the other one was Ashkabad and it crosses over to the next city over here, that is Meshed. So here we are in, in, in the Soviet tanker. So they were given a couple of tankers and they were packed like you can, I don't need to say it. I mean, this picture says it all. And uh, that's how the people started crossing over to uh, Persia, to Iran. And uh, uh, I think the medical term for this level of starvation is marasmic, uh, because I've seen a couple of doctors, you know, like gasping, like, oh my God, is this, are these human? I said, well, yeah, these are the pictures that are coming up. So, uh, now, he had permission for soldiers and uh, whatever, women's auxiliary. And then to get more and more people out, these are the children, boys as young as 10, 11, 12. So they were, you know, he categorized them as cadets. That, okay, you're not cadets, you know. So they are also soldiers and they are also, because if the fathers are no, no more there, I mean, it's this young man in that traditional society who's the head of the family. So if, if the boy joins as the army as a cadet, then his family also gets a passage out of Russia. And in that chaos, that entire chaos, uh, th there's a whole lot of uh, correspondence in the uh, uh, public records office, na National Archives of, of UK, where, where uh, they are, you know, talking of, uh, you know, they're, they're pleading that we, we, you know, we need to get our people out. And uh, the British are like, where, where, where are we going to go? You know, where, where can you take so many civilians in this war? That's not working. So that is the time this gentleman, Digvijay uh, Maharaja, uh, Digvijay Singh Ji, Chancellor of the Chamber of Princes, and who was a member of the Imperial War Cabinet. I mean, he steps in and is like a god. And he offers uh, his state, Jamnagar state, as a destination. And uh, we'll probably come to that in, in the end. So once that is worked out, uh, that's because India was not entirely British. We have these uh, parts of which are states. So these were quasi-autonomous bodies. So once uh, Jamsa's offer is there, then who swings into action? Uh, this is uh, Mr. Eugene Banashinsky, and I, I can't pronounce it in the Polish way, so it actually translates to Eugene. And this is his wife, Kira Banashinska. And she's actually the heroine of the story. Uh, if if Jamsayev is the hero, then she is the heroine because he can make the offer, and she actually made it happen. Now, the Banashinskys were the uh, first. Uh, Polish Consul General to India. In 1933, they had arrived. The consulate started in 1934. And the office was at 30 um, Mepinsi Road. So uh, now they, she became the delegate of the Red Cross, the Polish Red Cross, delegate for India, Burma, Ceylon, Strait Settlement. And the Red Cross got an office at 15 Napiancy Road and uh, became functional in 1939. So immediately she swung into action and first she becomes the delegate, then you know, she's helping her husband make speeches, collect donations, um, collect all the material, because now 
things have to go to Soviet Russia uh, to give relief to the people because they are getting a lot of, uh, they're getting all the information of the distress that the people are in. So this is the route, if you, I mean, what I've said earlier. So the route that was chalked out was the Ashkabad Meshed route. And this road, this Zahedan Shus, the Zahedan Bajan Shus road, this was under development as a lend lease route. This was not an established good road. So now they said, okay, we will, I think somewhere, yes, this is the way the, the, the road was under construction at that time. Wait, wait a minute. Before that, I must stop for a minute. Now, when the Polish uh, consulate was operational here, um, just after the war began, and then started the influx of the Jewish uh, evacuees who, who were coming through the uh, Trans-Siberia, Japan, China route. And there was also a British policy actually that, you know, that said that, okay, let all the Jews go to, go to India, which of course is uh, uh, the point for another discussion, but uh, because in Bombay particularly, it, it, they, would, they were stopping, there were halts in, Kolkata and uh, and uh, Bombay. Now, I'm using the older name, not not the current name, because I'm talking about an older period. So they, they were the, so Bombay actually has three. I think there's been a talk on on the Jewish community of Bombay, but there's actually another community, and that's the European community. Besides the Baghdadi, besides the Bene Israelis and the Baghdadis, there was also the European community because the, the Polish consulate was facilitating them. And there are there is material in the archives which says that the, the, the uh, consulate is keeping them from starving. I don't know what that means, keeping them from starving. I mean, <laughs> it's your imagination. <laughs> what do you think it could mean? But that activity was already on from, from 1939 to 40. So by 1942, when, when, the, when the kids had to come, uh, so here is Kira. Uh, she she's collected money. She, she so they've they've gotten permission from from the British Army. They've organized these Chevrolet trucks, and here it is she's standing and and you know blankets and food and medicines and and even basic things like soap etc. So here this lucky lady uh, and she managed to convince her husband and the rest of the consulate staff and she said. Look, if all these trucks are going to be going all the way up to up to South Russia, where, where there, is, there is such a big Polish community, why can't the same trucks, instead of coming back empty, bring the kids back? And everybody was shocked, including the British. Like, this, what, what? Like, are you crazy? This is what a preposterous road, because preposterous idea, because it's an un semi-built, untried road, and we just don't know what's going to happen. And she insisted, she said, they are, you know, who knows whether they're going to live anyway or not. So at least this way, they, there is a, there's a chance. If we can get, manage to get them out, if, if they make it, well and good. If they don't, well, casualty, what to do? I mean, in any case, they don't have very high chances. Finally, they got convinced, so who goes? So there are a couple of people. This is... Uh, Deputy Consul uh, Lyshevsky, then there's a doctor, Stanislav Konarski, there is somebody called Henry Khadala, and they had this uh, driver. Now, because this picture is from Polish sources, it just is taking into account these four Polish people, uh, men. But actually with them were about six, six soldiers. I'm sorry, we really, I have not found any record of their names or picture or anything. It's just, it just is. Uh, these people uh, and this guy called Daljek, they, they, they think the world of him, and six, six soldiers. So these people, they, they took those lorries, drove through that treacherous terrain, went to South Russia, delivered their, their relief material, and then got the children and they drove back. So the first stop, where they can actually sigh, uh, you know, take a sigh of relief is in Quetta. This is the first group 
no one expected them to survive, so there are no pictures. So these are pictures of the second group, where our informant Tadeusz Dabrowski is there, and his he has this collection because his mother was one of the uh, adult guardians. So they they crossed over to then Indian border at Nokundi on second of April, and then I think reached Quetta the same late evening, and that's where you know it's okay. Like we can take us we are safe. We have reached India. And uh, this is once the entire group has reached Mumbai. And this is at the St. Mary's ch Church or Cathedral. I'm not sure because the Polish sources call it a church. And I think it's a cathedral. Uh, so this is Kira Banashinska. This is Eugene. This is, uh, this is the uh, deputy consul. And uh, of course, the two, there are two priests over here. And this guy, he's a military chaplain, Father Pluto. He will, uh, he became the commandant of the camp at Balachari later on. And this is one very famous, Polish famous uh, actress, uh, cabaret singer, uh, Hanka Ordonovna. And uh, she was brought out through this group and there are some other people. So this is the, once they've reached, this is the Thanksgiving mass at the uh, St. Mary's Church in Bandra. And this is where the children, this is the inside of the church. So because earlier Polish uh, community seems to have these three very, very strong uh, binding uh, values. So one is religion, very strong Catholicism and school and scouting. I mean, these three are the basis of their national life. So most of the pictures are around these three themes. So this is the Thanksgiving mass at St. Mary's. And then uh, they were housed in two huge bungalows. So I walked around in, in Bandra and I couldn't figure out, but this bungalow seemed to meet the description no one has the address, so this is a representational picture of one of those large bungalows with 15 rooms overlooking the sea, and the kids were like absolutely thrilled with that. So this is the time that they're having in uh, Bandra, their visit to the sea, they're just recouping, their health checks, and they're, they're being put in sanatoriums, they're being fed. The most important thing is, they are being fed three meals a day, you know, proper nourishing because for almost two years, these people have not had a proper meal. There are, uh, you know, my, my uh, I call him my diarist, Franek Herzog, whose diary is um, part of my book. I mean, in, in his description, it's hair raising. They, they, they were actually hunting prairie dogs and skinning them with their own hands and eating for lack of anything else to do. So from, from that, uh, you know, here they are being fed three meals a day. And uh, sometimes I asked a few more difficult questions and the general reply was that there was somebody to put some clothes over our bag and feed us. And for that, we were grateful and we just did whatever we were told to do. So here, this is uh, Brother Yustashi. And here they're getting getting familiar with the with the local flora and fauna. So this is Bandra camp, uh, where they stayed for about six months. So these uh, I'm I'm focusing much more on Bandra camp, and we'll just discuss the other camps briefly. Now, in March is also Easter, and uh, the description said that they had celebrated Easter with the back of a truck as an altar. Uh, when, when they were driving through um, uh, Iran. So here they are celebrating a belated Easter and they have some something called, with, you know, dunking water and things like that. So so all the celebrations were, were put on hold till they reached uh, Bandra. And this over here is uh, Franek Herzog as a kid and his brother is also there. And this is outside the St. Mary's church. And uh, then as boys, they started bringing out a little newsletter for, for everybody, you know, to display their, how much of their preschool learning they still retained after two years in the wild. 
and he noticed the price five bananas this was a parody on the indian uh, uh, currency of that time you know annas so they made it into bananas and it's true in fact this is where they also narrated a very very sweet story as uh, once they reached india they they had to form and uh, to sing the british national anthem which is god save the king and they are polish and there is no such sound in in polish so it's all sh or z or something so the national anthem god save the king it sounds more like god save the king and well it goes on like that and uh, these are two nuns i met um, i'm afraid they are no more now but when i was researching in 2002 3 So this is Sister Mary Gonzaga, and this is Sister Margaret Hookwell from the convent. I think it is linked to this in Mary's because I I met one Spanish father who took me to the convent to meet these two nuns. He said, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I know something. I know somebody who knows something about what you're talking about. And they have very, very pleasant. They had very pleasant memories. I mean, she remembered the the crib. being decorated during christmas and uh, she had interaction with them in karachi and in panchgani uh, so now this is a map this is from a polish source so here we can see uh, now these are the various camps in delhi uh, camps in india delhi is of course because simply because it's the capital and they had a very very brief hold so quetta they would have a big big halt it was a military station and the first group from quetta they reached delhi and then they reached bombay and they stayed in 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 bandar camp and then after 6 months when the camp at balachari was was ready they moved to balachari jamnagar and uh, since that became uh, a very good uh, um, model to be followed because it it's a uh, subservient it was not formally uh, british territory so the british could very you know look the russians in the eye and say oh they are not with us but it was but they could manage to help them because it is territory subservient to the british and this model was then uh, replicated almost all over the world uh, kolhapur was also a princely state and um, and in a later map we'll see they they went to uh, british east africa which was okay something i'm i'm not 100% sure what was the politics over there and then instead of us they they are housed in mexico so uh, that's how you know india is the first and it gave the gave the political model however uh, getting back to the camps in india so there were camps in in karachi and and an american camp at malir was later taken off so they would come down from here these this red sea and all and uh, the ships would halt at karachi and from karachi uh, there would be some sort of a sorting taking place so there were there were groups that went to mexico from karachi those who wanted to stay in baliwade stayed put in malir camp then uh, so all uh, uh, people going to africa would 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 change over here like there was push that to get all the civilians out so all the civilians were being pushed out from from tehran and coming to karachi and then from karachi it was like okay you you are going wherever you have to go and the remaining places mount abu panchgani these are schooling centers so and bombay of course uh this is because all these camps balachari and kolhapur uh, they did have schooling facilities but only up to a level so there were children of all ages so the older children were then being sent to school in in mount abu the girls went to the convent in karachi from from balachari and bombay remained throughout we will see that because again from kolhapur panchgani was a hill station and a convent but yet they needed i get higher schooling so they were come they would come to mumbai this is an overview of the camp at balachari this was made on a spur uh, the area where the uh, where jam sahib himself had his summer residence so that was the place with the best climate in, in, in kathiawada and school 
and uh, the Polish flag over here. And this is scouting. And this is ours truly, Tadeusz Dobrostensky. This is his brother, Jerzy. This is their mother, Janina. This is the scout teacher, Mrs. Patak. Uh, I don't know who this person is. And this person, we will meet him again. He survived uh, Carter very narrowly. Like he was very junior, he was a lieutenant. And uh, I had the honor of meeting him in Warsaw later on. And he said, I was seeing my seniors go, you know, batch by batch. And since nobody said anything, we didn't know what was happening, but uh, they were not coming back. We were not hearing from them. And no one knew what was happening to them. And uh, this is, it, it was a very, 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 you know, sinister feeling. And uh, probably it was like just a little before his time, just like General Anders, I mean, uh, the amnesty was, was called. And uh, he, so he's a survivor, he's a real soldier. So he comes to India to be with these kids as scout master because the children are all orphans. I mean, they need role models. This is the camp at Valiwade, Valiwade Halt it was. It was a small halt that the British created after uh, Kolapur station, 30 miles out of Kolapur. And it was all wilderness, but the camp was created over there. And this is a school in Valiwade. So, uh, I mean, I've seen people move for years. This little bit of matting is still there. This is a science class in progress. So these are the kids, but then, Kids who grow older and needed more schooling, higher schooling, here it is, they are in Mumbai. And this is at St. Mary's Convent. And uh, this person is Jan Shedletsky, the person who shared this picture. And they, they had English lessons also while in India, which they valued very much in later life. And uh, here's another picture from uh, St. Mary's Convent. And the, the, the records are also saying that some of the children uh, attended uh, JJ School of Art. You know, I could not locate a picture, so I just have it uh, on, a, on a document that they attended JJ School. So if, if anybody in the audience has the time <laughs> to go to JJ School records and pull out the details, it would be such a valuable addition. This is schooling in Panchgani. So again, the convent school, and this is possibly more of the girls over here. And also in Mumbai, Bombay was the Polish hospital because Bombay has remained the, the most important transit camp after for the Poles after Tehran. So this is the Red Cross hospital. This little thing over here reads Charney Road. Now, I don't know which direction, east or west of Chani Road this is. This is a building right next to Chani Road Station, which was the Polish Red Cross Hospital. So here, here is the inside of the hospital. And this is the trainee nurses from the camps, the older girls. So they had the choice of either training to be teachers or training to be um, nurses. So these are the trainee nurses. And this is Dr. Bazirgan. Dr. Bazigan was, was an Iranian man who had come, now, I'm not 100% sure because this material is from the autobiography of Kira Vanashinska. It's a very slim little book. So she's not particularly clear about Dr. Bazirgan, whether she says, mentions that he's a, an Iranian man, but it's not clear whether he came with them from Tehran or he was already in India, I don't know. But here he is, an Iranian man with, uh, uh, because they didn't have doctors. They, they, they were really short of doctors. Whatever doctors they had were all in the service of the Second Polish Corps. So when they needed doctor, I mean, he came from Iran. And uh, another very important person in this Polish saga in Mumbai is this lady, Wanda Danowska, Uma Devi. She, she was a theosophist. And she came to India in the early 1930s as a disciple of Mahatma Gandhi, who actually gave her the name Uma Devi. 
So when the war broke out, she was working very closely with uh, the Banashinskis in raising awareness about the situation in, in, in Poland and everything that was happening there and raising funds. So she was, they, they started bringing out this newsletter, Poles in India. And she even, uh, for the schooling purpose, when they could not find all the pre-war books, they started developing books. And I have the, the, the original over here. Uh, this is the original written by her, this lady. And here's another one, you know, the geography of India. They started, so if we look at it, you know, war relief services. So they, they were bringing out these books in, in, in Bombay. So, and here I have this receipt for the for the receipt, uh, the, the fee paid of one of the children, uh, or some of the children from Balachari by the school, St. Mary's High School, Mount Abu, Rajasthan. And uh, this is the, also from a book, this is uh, from one of the Polish books. This is about the dispersing of where they went after India, you know, it's, they did not settle in India. It's not that they lived on in India. They, they went to different parts of the world. So, so this is talking about, so there, there was a huge Polish community in, in Iran. And they, because they were initially Iran was very, Persia was very reluctant, but later on, you know, they, they settled down to the idea that these people have had a very, very hard time and they need a place to stay. And but that came actually, you know, that acceptance came later. Initially it was like, okay, you just have to use us as a transit, you know, fine. Use us as a bridge country, do whatever you have to and move out quickly. Anuradha? Uh, so yes. This yes. is Farooq. You wanted to be reminded at 8.45. Yes, please. Thank you so much. Yeah. We, we, thank you so much. So the, the first uh, place that gave them uh, war duration domicile was India, Balachari in particular, and then uh, later on the other places. So Mumbai was also, as I mentioned earlier, between Karachi and Mumbai. Mumbai, more importantly, was a huge port and from where all this dispersal took place. Here yeah, they've gone, you can see these routes, they've gone to uh, British East Africa, Kenya and Tanganyika and all that and South Africa. And they went by, by sea to Mexico. There are a bunch of kids who reached uh, New Zealand. Uh, so all of this, and then of course, when, when the final time came for, the, for the, all of them to be repatriated. They, they, they were going to Europe, so through Italy, through to UK. So these are all the, this is all the dispersal that took place. Just a few weeks earlier, um, uh, somebody connected with me, uh, Colonel RPS Bhalla. His father was the last commandant of, of Alivadi camp, who, who was, you know, seeing off the, the, the camp presidents. After, because after Balachari closed, it went to Kolhapur. Uh, uh, so when Kolhapur had to close, the residents were being sent to different, different places, amongst them Africa. And there was actually a lot of failure. You know, Tadeusz Dobrostensky, his father had passed away. They, had, they didn't find any relatives. So they were asked to move out. So when India was closing, they were asked to go and wait it out in British East Africa, and where the conditions were not very good. In fact, Tadeusz in his testimony said that they had a rebellion and they said, we want to go back to India. And UNRRA said, no, you can't because Indian camps are closed now. So now we don't have a picture of that, um, uh, saying goodbye at uh, uh, Bombay docks. But uh, Mr. Colonel Bhalla did recall that his father was, was instrumental. And uh, afterwards, in 1991 or 92, is when, uh, after Poland became uh, democratic, once it had shaken off its communist uh, government, people started coming back. So the first thing they did is come and put a plaque, this memorial plaque at uh, at Balachari. I think you can read this Hindi. And this is really beautiful. One day Durki Bhumi, Bhumi Kripalu, Bhumi Dayalu, Sarbhumi, one day. So they're extremely grateful. And I think this 
picture is also so telling this woman in a sari with a with a with a very hungry child in her own lap but she's accepting this other child a boy in shorts you know representative of a european child so they came back and this is uh, this is Kira Baneshinska. By then she is in her 90s. And uh, well, I'll just tell you about her. And these are two boys, you know, this is Vyeshlav Stipula, and this is Stefan Bukowski. And uh, Jam Sahib is no more by then, so they're meeting his son. This is Jam Sahib Shatru Shala Singhji, Shataji, Jam Shataji. This is uh, the palace uh, reception. Now, Kira. Kira and her husband, Eugene, they lost their diplomatic status once uh, the, the government of Poland got de-recognized. They, they were in the UK at that time. First, they got called to UK by the Polish government in exile. They were there. They lost the diplomatic status. They tried to make a livelihood over there, and then they couldn't. They came back to India. 1960, or a little before that, they came back to India. They said, that's at least where we were respectable people. Or, I'm sorry, somewhere in 1950s. And in 1964, they embraced Indian citizenship. So both uh, Eugene and Kira actually rest in Mumbai. They were great friends of, of the Tatas. And uh, so there are a whole bunch of papers in the Tata Central Archives, you know, very personal letters, very warm and friendly ones exchanged between Kira and Jayadi. And these people, they, they remember India very well. And you see this man, this is Father Peshkovsky. So he survived, the, he survived Katyn, he survived the war, he became a priest, he wrote about the Katyn Forest Massacre. Uh, I, I hope you can see it, he, he wrote about it. And he became the, he was the sole guardian, you know, and the kind of rallying figure around all this whenever they would get together. And this person is His Excellency Mr. Anil Vadva. He was then the ambassador of India, uh, of ambassador of India to Poland. And they keep coming back very often. And uh, this is some of them. And uh, when, I, when I was researching in 2005, we, there was actually a reception hosted for them at the new palace in, in uh, uh, Kolhapur. This is me sitting with the group. And uh, in fact, that's where one of these people actually quipped. He was the British husband of one of the Polish survivors. And he says, yes. he says, I guess it's only in India that former refugees are, uh, you know, received at the palace. I mean, they come back for a visit and they get a reception in the palace. He says, I think this happens only in India. And at that time, I was a journalist. And I thought, well, yes, this is a sentiment that is worth noting. Uh, this is uh, Father Peshkovsky. As I mentioned, I had the honor of meeting him in, in Warsaw. Uh, 20 minute meeting, 20 minutes is what he had granted me, lasted two hours. And he started narrating to me the whole story. And post war, they, uh, they named the school after Jam Sahib Digvijay Singh Ji. Because uh, he had been asked, What can we do to you know, repay your kindness? And he said, Okay, after the war, you can name a road after me. So during the communist period, they couldn't do anything. So as soon as that period was over, they, they had a row. They had a school, one of the very elite schools with two branches. So this is Roman Gutowski, one of the survivors from, from India against the school. And the present uh, uh, ambassador of uh, Poland to India, Adam Bukowski or something, whatever, he's a graduate of the school. And more recently, they have named a town square and since Maharaja Digvijay Singh Ji, Ranjit Singh Ji is, is too long and too much of a mouthful for them, so it's like the good Maharaja square. This is uh, Jan Shibletsky. We saw him earlier at the school, uh, St. Mary's group. Uh, he became an architect. He came back and they put a monument in Kolhapur. So this is uh, uh, Shah Maharaj. This is somebody from the Polish consulate. This is Colonel Gaikwad. And this is Jan Chidlecki. They're, they're putting a commemorating, commemorative monument over here with a, with a Polish eagle. And as some elements fused from the Mahalakshmi Mandir and 
Polish sentiments. This is yours truly with Jan at London. And these are some more people. This is the, the diarist, uh, Franek Herzog. He is, of course, no, no more there uh, with his family. And uh, this is the Warsaw Group, uh, Roman, Mieszlo Stipula, and Shmignu Vartosh. This is uh, Tadeusz in Australia. And this is a Jewish person, Jigmund Mendel. He, he was in Israel. After my thesis came out, he, he wrote to us. And this is the, sorry, and this is the group. Uh, they had a reunion after the book came out. This is a whole lot of children from Balachari. They were adopted uh, by the uh, missionary mission school at uh, Orchard Lake, Michigan. So they had uh, also in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, 50 girls, Bernadine sisters uh, adopted 50 girls. So these 81 children, so this is a small, I think just one eight out of 81 people, uh, they got together with their spouses uh, for a reunion. It just it was prompted uh, by the publication of my book. This is Franek Herzog over here, so, so let him have, enjoy the life. And these are some of the Indians there. Uh, this lady is with us this evening. Uh, she put me onto the story. She told me this incredible story of her mother, Zofia, uh, when I was a journalist. And I said, no, you've got to be kidding. And I could not place the story for 10 years into perspective. And after that, I started working. So Christine, come on, <laughs> show yourself. And this is uh, another lady. She she. She's, of course, I don't think uh, yeah, she's there anymore. She's in Gold, she used to be in Gold. And here, this is Tanuta Mujavar. She okay. used to live in Mumbai. Where is Christine? Yes, hi, Christine. Hi. <laughs> Do you recognize yourself here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think both of us were much younger when you put me on this fascinating story. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It was really lovely. So what a what a journey you put it all just now. Yeah. So just give me a minute. I, mean, I, I I think you could also take some questions once we finish. So oh ma'am, how, ma 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 how are you? Hello, ma'am, how are you? What an honor. And uh, how did this story come about? To to wrap it up in, in, in the interest of time. This is the Vijay Singh I mean. How did he make this offer? So this was such a question that, that you know, it was such a frequent question that why and how did he make this offer? And it turns out that this is Ranji, the famous cricketer. It's IPL season now, so we all ought to know who is Ranji. And uh, here's Ranji. So he, Ranji was a part of the uh, League of Nations deliberations. He was representing India on behalf of Ganga Singh of Bikaner and sometimes Bhupender uh, um, Singh of Patiala. Uh, he was representing India. He, he would fill in for them very often. And uh, he was representing India at the League of Nations discussion. So he had this, this is a representative picture. He had a picture of uh, Chateau in, uh, uh, in Switzerland where he would be waiting because it was take time. And uh, Jam Saheb, uh, Digvijay Singh, I mean, Ranji had no children. He was not married. He had no children. So who would be his heir? So there were a uh, few princes. Uh, among them was Jam, Jam Saheb, Digvijay Singh Ji. So these princes used to spend a lot of time with, uh, with, with Ranji at the Chateau. And at that time, they had social relations with, this is Ignacy Padrewski. He is a musician, he's a pianist, and he became a Poland, uh, a premier of Poland, prime minister of Poland after the First World War. So they had social relations. And during the Second World War, when, when, when Poland had catapulted again, and uh, they were you know, in intense discussions with the British uh, of how to negotiate through the situation. And uh, the Brit British had uh, an attitude which Professor Norman Davis describes as, you know, that everybody else was like a client state, even you know, the Britain and US are the great state, great powers and everybody else is a client state. So during the, some of the meetings, 
it was during a lunch hour, lunch time, you know, I mean, then uh, Jamsa was, was a part of those meetings being the, a member of the Imperial War Cabinet representing India. And he was listening to all of this, what was happening and the attitude and everything. So during one of the meetings, during the lunch hour, he just told, uh, they knew each other. So they had, a, they had a, uh, some sort of social uh, interaction. During the lunch hour, he just told him, he says, OK, uh, I can see and understand that your, your people are in deep trouble. So if a destination is what you need for your people, my state is yours. And uh, so now with a destination, now you work out the rest with the British. That's when it goes back to Kira. So when Kira heard that, she is the one who, who worked it out. And these are just a couple of uh, the key points. And I think the, one of the, besides being the first country to offer war duration uh, domicile to these people and, and a political model to extend help to them, I think what's also extremely important is uh, in the documents we found that in 1942 48 period, you know, the Indian people through, they contributed rupees six lakhs, which now, converts to what, over more than six million. It's almost six and a half million in uh, income value. And Bombay was the nodal transit uh, city. Uh, I think it compares only to Tehran. And Tehran also became, um, you know, got into it by force, whereas Bombay was kind of more voluntary because Kira was there, I mean, they worked out, Kira and Eugene, they worked out, so they, they, they collected, you know, they made so many um, road shows or whatever, presentations, they collected money, they collected supplies, they sent those trucks, those children came, they stayed in Bandra, they kept going back and forth. I mean, the, the camp at Bandra, the transit camp at Bandra uh, did not shut down till the, almost the last post left. Uh, and this is second only to possibly Tehran. Uh, Tehran was, you know, kind of coerced into it. Another major port was Karachi, but Karachi is not that important, or I would say uh, Bombay overshadows Karachi because uh, even the relief, the initial relief boats went out of Karachi, uh, went, sorry, out of Bombay. And uh, Karachi was just a halting station. And with that, questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anuradha. It was fascinating. What a, besides the exodus and the hardships, what a great human interest story that was. Yes, that's exactly how it started. Uh, as a journalist, that's what actually got my interest. That you have the lady window <laughs> who started yes. it all. <laughs> yes. So let's move on to the questions. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the political climate in Bombay? How was Poland allowed to set up a consulate when uh, it was under British rule at that time? Uh, were there allies? Were there, was there some kind of cold shoulder, live and let live kind of relationship? I have to be honest and say that I really did not get much into the details of it. But yes, Poles were allies uh, because uh, Poland did not exist as a country before the First World War. Mm -hmm. Before the First World War, for 123 years, Poland did not exist. It was divided up between uh, Russia, Austria, and Germany. And uh, so, you know, it was like throwing a salvo that uh, they, uh, you know, for this, actually, you need to refer how Poland came into existence in Europe. Uh, okay. You need to refer to Professor Norman Davies' work. But yes, uh, Poland had a guarantee, the British guarantee of Poland. So I would assume that as a part of that, uh, they set up a consulate in, in um, Bombay. And as we saw in that uh, Red Cross, should I go back for, no, for straight very, very, very vast area. Correct. Very, very, for a very India, Silicon. Straight settlement. That's uh, that's Malaya, Malaysia. So for all that huge region, they, they set up a. They were allowed to set okay. up a consulate in, in Mumbai, okay. and that was in 1933. Correct. Um, 
the question from Nikhil was, what was the main reason for the persecution of the Poles by the Russia? Was it racial or was it political, according to you? Um, no, it's not according to me. Uh, it's kind of, it's established. You see, it is um, Poland. First of all, it came out uh, out. You know, Dr. Professor Davis says you know it was like Poland was like three undigested parts in three different stomachs. So after the First World War, they all came out. So nobody was particularly happy to lose territory and you know have this new entity come up on the map of Europe. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the things. Now, once uh, the country had come up, what they did is they had waged wars with Russia and gained territory because uh, the eastern part, the Cressy area, they had because they were going by some notion of some country that was there in the past. Mm -hmm. So they had had wars and in all the area that they had uh, managed to gain control of, of the Russian territory, what they had done is they had settled the military veterans mm -hmm. with grants of land. In fact, uh, Christine's grandfather, Zofia, she had told me, her father was a veteran, Madam Zofia had told me. And he was a veteran and they had a huge uh, grant of land and they grew sugar beet over there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, And that is actually the story. So once Russia got hold of that land, the first thing it did was, all right, ethnic cleansing, you know, get all the poles out. So don't push them in a, at, to a place where they can congregate. So like just decimate them. So the mm. officers were decimated at, at, at Katyn and uh, the families were, were sent to more or less extermination in the cold uh, parts of Russia. And this was, um, thank you for asking this question because there's another part, part to it. This was not um, denomination centric initially. It was just anybody who was Poles, because there were a lot of Jewish people also who were in this. Subsequently, after the German uh, policy, you know, the, uh, the Jews, a lot of Jews were asked, where do you stand? And uh, there are scholars who have all sorts of, you know, there are, there are many, many, many interpretations. So some feel the, the, the Poles, uh, uh, le, you know, let the Jews down. Sometimes they, some pe pe people felt the Jewish community, you know, changed sides. In fact, a whole lot of Jewish officers uh, and men and families came out with the Anders Army. Mm -hmm. In fact, the first premier of Israel, Menahem Begin, he was yeah. a corporal with Anders Army. By then, mm -hmm. you know, by the time Anders Army reached Russia, uh, sorry, Persia, and uh, this Jewish question was up and he, he said, uh, uh, you know, maybe people have two nationalities and they can choose which one they want to follow. Mm -hmm. So Handa's army again was, you know, located in Palestine and there's a huge number of desertions there. Mm -hmm. So it was not ethnic, it was, it was more political. Right. So uh, the question was, uh, are there any descendants of these children? Of course, you mentioned and introduced us to Christine. Are there any others who live in India now? Uh, the, any descendants of uh, the children? The children, no, not really. Uh, but there were some, uh, they, there were six. You, mu you must remember that these are 19, this is 1946, 47. This was right. a time when Europeans were not allowed, you know, to really socialize with Indians. So. You know, Christine married Dr. Uh, Mendonca in in, uh, in in Ahwaz, in, in Palace, uh, Persia. And uh, she traveled with him there from there. But um, the other lady, if we go back uh, here, uh, they have a very, very, and he's Kashikar, he's a, he's a Brahmin. Although they have, a, they have a very rich story, or they had. It's just that I, mean, I was too tired to sit down and take a note of it. I mean, it's it's a, it's really a story in race relations. And this is uh, Danuta Mojavar. And uh, she married a Mr. Mojavar. And mm -hmm. you, you can see from the child, I mean, yes. And uh, uh, these Kashikar's grandchildren, yes, they are partially Polish. And, and there's some other families also, but not all want to actually highlight their, their Polish heritage. That's mm -hmm. one thing I have seen. And there is a reason for it. And that, uh, you know, if you will give me a few minutes. Um, 
this I understood during the book launch in, in London, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, here, Franek's great nephew was there at the London book launch. And uh, so we asked him to join us, you know, at the stage. And we just said, like, this, this story has been in your family from the time it happened. And you're here. And, and this person, Richard Herzog, he was a history teacher. So I was all the more curious. I said, why did it take a person like me, a person untrained in history? I mean, whatever training I had in history was like an instant injection that Dr. Dixit could, you know, Professor Dixit could kind of give me. And I used to argue <laughs> my head off with him at that time. <laughs> so I was very, very curious. And he said, he said, look, you know, this was bad memories because the grandfather was shot. I mean, criminals were shot. And, you know, so what is your association with with your grandfather being shot? That he was a criminal. Is that it is that thing. The the grandmother is lying in an unmarked grave in Kazakhstan. These were bad memories. We didn't want to talk about it. In fact, even uh, Madam Zofia, there were times when she she expressed her annoyance at me. You come back and you ask so many questions. It brings back all the bad memories. You know, I, I'm I'm very surprised and I'm absolutely honored that she's sitting through this and 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 I I can only apologize if she comes <laughs> later tonight. So these are bad memories for a lot of people. They didn't want to revisit it. It it took a lot of effort and persuasion and more than me. It is what Professor Norman Davies wrote, and which mm. was being held up that it was not your fault. Mm. It's just so something. Yeah, please. You spoke about bad memories and we saw the children enjoying themselves on the beach. So who was looking after the children while they were in Mumbai? Was, was it primarily the consulate? You did mention six lakh rupees were ra was raised to help them out. Were there any other names or organizations who stand out in this humanitarian aid effort? Uh, the, uh, the Polish uh, camp, Polish Red Cross, essentially, they, they had a whole lot of ladies you know, probably widows uh, of officers. A uh, lot of mothers had lost their children because there are there are those very, very painful stories. And uh, that, that I think Mrs. Patak, if we can go back, uh, Mrs. Patak is one of those people, she had lost her child, uh, yeah, this, this lady. She had lost her husband and uh, in the, somewhere in the camps and she had lost her child uh, to at the to the fevers in Guzar, and she was miserable. And there was a bishop there, in the a Polish bishop, Bishop Kavlina. And uh, so you know, she was miserable, and like, what do I do? And he said, there are so many children who have lost their mothers, so you have to make the synergies. So there were a lot of now Mrs. Dobroshtanska over here. She had lost her husband, so she had her two boys. So. So she came as a guardian to everybody else. So yes, there were a lot of orphans, but there were there were a whole lot of ladies as well. So these were the people. And the Poles themselves were very, very cohesive. And they, they were very clear that they didn't want to lose their national fabric because if I go into that presentation, there are, there are you know, with one's pictures with the Poles and their, with the kids in their national costumes and all. So, and Maybe as an organization, it is the church. Okay. It's the church. Okay. Strongly. Okay. Um, uh, I know it sounds very crass to ask for a quantitative figure. How many children do you think would have been totally involved in this exodus? How many would have reached Mumbai? And how many were, was the total population of children who, if I may say, saved in that sense? Yeah. You know, that figure is a bit ambiguous. Jams I have wrote invitation for 500 children twice okay so officially the the just the orphaned children uh, were 1000 there were permission for 1000 but what was also happening is this these are very tragic stories you know mothers would would actually put their children in the transport for uh, of the orphanages that mm -hmm. okay at least there is somebody taking care of them Mm. and, uh, you know, declare them orphans because they don't know whether they will survive or not. And if by chance they, they survive, so the Red Cross was working overtime. Now, here's a very, very tragic story, but I must just remind me in case I lose sight of the yeah. uh, figure uh, to answer your figure question. 
this person, he has a very, very sad story or unique uh, or, or whatever you want to call it. He reached India as, a, as an orphan. His mother had put him in the transport and he reached and he reached Balachari and he lived as an orphan. And his name was on the list of the boys be adopted by, by the Orchard Lake Seminary and he was to go to the US. And one of the other boys had found his, his family and they wrote that, so the exchange of letters that is taking place is says Miss, one Mrs. Gutowski is living with us because there were two or three families at that time, you know, post-war situation, two or three families sharing a house. So the boy writes very, you know, takes, takes one of, I mean, his pictures, one of the camp pictures and says, oh, even I have a Gutowski sharing my dorm. And he sends the picture. And that's how the mother and the son find each other. And he got his name off. He went with whatever letter, you know, when the mother says that, I'm so glad to find you, my son. And he goes to the camp commander with that letter and he says, I found my mother in Poland, so I don't want to go back to, I don't oh. want to go to. So each of these stories are so tragic, so heartbreaking. I cannot tell you. I get goose flesh. Mm -hmm. Okay, now getting back to figure, uh, figures. So we have a list of around 640 kids in okay. Balachari, uh, one of the official lists. So I think we'll take that as the thing, but, but children were coming and going, coming and going, but 640 is more or less the number of children in Balachari. Mm, okay. 5,000 uh, adults, women, and, and there was an orphanage there also. Uh, 5,000 families, in, uh, and a family included not just the mother and her children, but also like her relatives, children, you know, aunts, uncles, you know, whoever she was willing to, as many as, you know, she was willing to uh, hold on to, take care for with herself. So there were 500 families in, in Kolhapur. And the figures are that uh, 20,000 transited Karachi, 20,000 out of 37,000, because the total number of women and children who came out of Russia with the Anders army Mm -hmm. uh, 115,000, 77,000 troops, 37,000 uh, um, families, and 15,000 okay. orphans. So 20,000 of those 37,000 people transited Karachi okay. or en route to other places. 5,000 came to Kolhapur. Okay. And uh, there was space for 1,000 but around 650 uh, stayed in uh, Balachari. So the question from Kaizad was, how did this migration from Russia towards Iran start? What was the basis for that? And why were they not stopped? Um, I think I'll need to go back to one of my earliest slides. That's because uh, the Russians carried them off. So okay. here, this is the, the, the molotov ribbentrop line. And mm -hmm. these areas, these, these never got, went back to Poland again. So these areas were, were taken over by Russia and ethnically cleansed. Mm -hmm. So then these people were, were sent. So here it is. And uh, they, they were sent to all these penal uh, settlement camps. And the officers were shot, in, uh, shot dead in Katyn. And this entire thing changed once uh, the Operation Barbarossa took place, where, where uh, Germany the, uh, turned against its former ally, Russia. That's when Russia changed sides from being uh, right. with Germany to, to uh, being on the Russian, uh, sorry, to with UK and US, becoming right. an ally. So once that happened, they had to they were woefully short of uh, army. Mm -hmm. That's when the British prevailed on them that you have so many poles. That's how General Anders was given and they, they declared amnesty. Okay. And General Anders uh, formed his army and uh, came out of Russia along okay. with this entire thing. I mean, his story is absolutely like a Latter-day Moses. Mm -hmm. A practical question from Dr. Kelkar. How did they manage so many photos and who supplied all the equipment in the developing? Uh, could you kindly repeat the question once again, please? 
the photographs which you showed, uh, he wanted to know how come there are so many photographs existing and who supplied the photos and the equipment? Uh, there are no photos from uh, Russia. There are no. absolutely no photos from Russia because they were starving. They, they, they would sell whatever clothes they had, coats, shoes, anything valuable. So there are no pictures from, from Russia at all. Okay, this is a family. This this postcard is a family souvenir. This is a, a post. This is a picture of General Anders uh, from from Persia, from Iran. And these are all pictures which were taken in in Persia, in Iran. And General Anders had had organized it because he was was documenting uh, the state with in which his people were. And this big collection of testimonies of the soldiers is there at Stanford, at the Hoover Center. I didn't have a grant to go there and read it. And then we, we just said, okay, let's, let's, I mean, forget about it because we are not, um, you know, looking at the story of the soldiers. We're mm -hmm. looking at the story of the children. So finding the children and building up uh, that part is what I focused on. But, mm -hmm. uh, General Anders was definitely recording because he got his soldiers to write the testimonies and they sit at the Hoover Center of Stanford uh, University. Okay. Um, uh, we have somebody in the audience named Meera Goshal. She says that her father took care of the Pol Polish refugees in India. And she says that her father was the first Indian to ever come to Poland. And she's asking you whether you found out during the course of your research, any references to Dr. Hiranmoy Goshal? I'm sorry, no. But okay. I, I, will, I cannot say that my research is exhaustive. My research, I would just put it as something very, very preliminary because I was struggling for research funds. Uh, I mean, whatever I could do is whatever I could uh, you know, find. The, the Charles Wallace Trust, helped out, the, uh, the Polish government gave me a visit. But most of these things, like, as I just said, you know, once it was like, go to, uh, I mean, the records are there in Stanford, I didn't have the resources. So my work is not exhaustive. My work is an introductory thing. I think there are lots of stories. I think I've just done a very, very small bit of putting this, bringing this out. And like, thanks to you that it's getting a bigger audience. And I was honestly speaking petrified at that time. And that's why I'm so grateful to Professor Dixit that, you know, I said, hey, people are going to eat me up. Like, there are no references to this story anywhere. Like, I'm, I'm pulling it out of strands. Like, where? I mean, so I, you know, documents, photos, testimonies, you know, he, he literally handheld me, like heuristics and humanistics, you know, take down oral history, you know, have a person's photo, have the signed testimony, so that, you know, if there is any question, at least you know where to go back. Like, okay, I've taken it. It's not a figment of my imagination. So my work is in no way exhaustive. There's a lot of work. There are a lot of stories. It's just that I put down a basic reference, like what I didn't have when I started. So Meera, uh, uh, Anuradha shared her email address. You might want to be in touch with her after after this. To trace. Yeah, I, I, it's here again. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So the next question is, um, was India's role with these refugees not recognized at all during the communist regime up till 1991, like you said? Not really, no. Actually, because you see, uh, do you realize that if they recognized India, they would have to recognize that they themselves had done something like they had been nasty to them. They didn't want to acknowledge that, no way. Hmm. So the moment, I think it's enough that those people, those who went there, they survived. One of them became a, a lieutenant colonel in the army. We don't know how, you know. But, you know, there are stories of people being targeted, those who had been abroad. I don't know how these people, some of these people, you know, they, they managed to live their lives in Poland uh, quite fine. It's a small group. It's a, it's a very small group. But at least they could say that we were children. We don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, Roman's son has some very interesting stories, but I think they just got away because uh, they were children. There were others, there were people who were imprisoned, 
the others, you know, the ones they had been abroad, the communist regime was quite harsh. So why would they acknowledge? In fact, that's exactly, and because there was no acknowledgement and wartime censorship, there was no acknowledgement by the British either. Uh, I, I didn't put it here. I was looking as a journalist, you know, when, when we hear that, you know, the news reports is the, is the first draft of history. And I said, where are the, where are the, where's the press coverage? And it was one uphill task. Find one article in Maratha, one article in, in, in uh, Daily Mail, you know, that's it. So are you saying that the mainline papers in Mumbai also did not cover this human interest no. story? Times of India? I did not find it. Okay. I did not Sad. find it. I will be very happy. I mean, somebody can please take up this. In <laughs> fact, there is something else also. Uh, it seems Jamsa have, had adopted these children, you know, when this communist government had come up and uh, there was a lot of tension at that time. So Jamsa have had, uh, Jamsa have his... Um, Lazen officer Colonel Jeffrey, Jeffrey Clark and Father Pluto. Together they had formed an adoption council a committee and they had adopted all the children from Balachari so that they could not be transfer, uh, transferred forcibly to, to Poland. And I just found a one line mention that these papers are uh, uh, watertight from the legal point of view. Now I, in fact, I didn't even know where to go and look for them. In, in Mumbai. Much later I came to know where the archives are and not. But okay, I think I have established my story and there are hundreds of parts of this, you know, anybody can start taking up and, you know, throwing more light on. Meera, the same lady who may Eric asked whether you had come across a father, she's got a comment over, she says that uh, she's Polish and Bengali, as she said earlier. The Russians sent about 2 million Poles to Siberia. That's her comment. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. I'm just yeah, looking so that, for the other questions, if there's, which have just straggled in. So uh, the, the figure given by uh, Dr. Keith Sword, who, who sadly died very young, as a post, he was a postdoc student. Uh, um, he was a postdoc student, yes, at uh, so, uh, School of Slavonic and East European Studies, SEAS. So his uh, phenomenal work, Deportation, uh, this is the name of the book and the figures I've got from this. Yes. This is key. Yeah, it's Deportation and Exile Poles in the Soviet Union 1939 to 48 by okay. Keith Sort, Studies in Russia and East Europe. So according to this book, 1.7 million uh, people were deported and uh, there may be fresh uh, work now. I had a major disadvantage. I don't know Polish language. In fact, ask Professor Dixit how he fired <laughs> me when that question came up in the university. And uh, this is Army in Exile. Uh, this is uh, the biograph autobiography of Lieutenant General Anders, the story of the Polish Second Corps. Wow. So, a couple of uh, pictures there uh, I've borrowed from this book. So you did show pictures of the of the kids going to St. Mary St. Mary School and the, the nurses in training. The question from Parvez was, did the kids pick up any Indian languages according to your knowledge? No, 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 no. They just learned to uh, sing the, uh, you know, they remained in a very Polish environment. And uh, the thrust was that they wanted to retain that Polish identity. There was actually, you know, initial events, this movement was being considered. There was a, a suggestion by the British that the children could be adopted uh, by certain, you know, well-to-do homes, to which the Polish authorities were, Kira and everybody else were like vehemently like, no, they must retain the Polish nationality. So the language, the school, the traditions, the clothes, the food, everything. In fact, uh, the only thing is, as a token of gratitude, what they learned was a the, the British national anthem, God Shave the King, and they, <laughs> and they could sing the the the, the Jamnagar uh, anthem. Uh, I could not find. I think it's kind of lost, you know. Uh, but uh, 
Princess Harshad Kumari ji was very touched when I had it and I played for her with these elderly people now in Warsaw when they could sing the Jai 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 Maharaja. But what had happened in Kolhapur was that the locals had picked up certain amount of Polish language. <laughs> okay. There are stories of you know people fighting, arguing amongst themselves in Polish in in Kolapur, okay. Some of the local people. Okay. Uh, one of our regular members who attends most of these talks, he said he had a power outage when you were talking about the transiting from Russia to Iran, and uh, he has made a small request if you could repeat it. Though you had, may you mentioned about the transiting of Iran again during the question answers. He wants to hear it again from you. Uh, where do you want me to start? Uh, the from? map, the map which you showed was very illustrative. All right, so I go go back there with the yes, indulgence of the rest of the group. Yes, please. Sure, sure, sure. Sh should I start from here? No, the, this particular map, uh, the next one. Okay, I'll, I'll go over it very quickly. So okay. the, this was uh, Poland. The way it was the map, it had come up after the First World War. So on 1st of September, uh, Germany invaded, it's the, the arrows in black. And on 17th of September, Russia invaded, which are the arrows in red. And prior to that, they had had, uh, had an agreement called the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, by which they had you know, made this design of how they would divide up uh, Poland into the Russian and the uh, German zones of influence. And the river Bug here, up to here is the river Bug, and the rest was, I think, arbitrary. So mm -hmm. once that had happened, the, the soldiers and everybody of whoever could be in a leadership position, the, uh, the uh, what do you call it? I mean, police officers, soldiers, members of the clergy, members of the judiciary, everybody was deported in, in three, four waves. There are four ways. 10th of uh, February stands out very strongly, and there are three other days. Uh, but most of the people that I spoke to, uh, most of the people spoke of 10th of Feb. 10th of Feb. Uh, but there were a couple of other dates also, which is there in the book. So people were, were, were deported. I mean, the officers were anyway taken uh, prisoner of war, and the families were put in these. I have no clue okay. who got this picture how. I have no clue, which is why I put it courtesy of a video fact. There's a group called the Crisis Siberia Group. So this is from their side because, uh, and and this is so telling. Look at this, the CCCP, you know, this is so telling. I, I have no clue who got this picture, but I'm using it here with permission. Okay. And uh, uh, this is oh, from sorry. a book. Uh, this is from a, a book, Stalin's ethnic cleansing. You know, this is the state of affairs in uh, uh, in Russia, how they were, you know, cutting lumber and, and freezing temperatures. I mean, it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. And so this is how the people were strewn all over, all over Russia. It was the, the wilderness of Tundra, Siberia, and uh, the emptiness of the Kazakh steppes. And, the, and after Operation Barbarossa, that is when Germany turned around and attacked uh, Russia, that's when Russia flipped sides and joined the Allies. Other side, and then yeah. they needed an army. And that's when the British said, you already have the Poles. You're holding on to the Poles. Why don't you do something? So that's when do the amnesty was declared. General Anders was released. And then all the officers, that's when, you know, when Anders started forming his army in Buzlok, I mean, it, it, there it, it's listed. It's given in pretty good details in this book. And he's wondering, he says, where are my officers? Because I'm just having, and, and a couple of officers, with, there were very few who were hidden as, uh, as soldiers. And he's like wondering, where are all my officers gone? And much, much, much later, you know, the, the captain thing came out. And so he formed the army. First he formed that Bozlok, and then he moved the army. In fact, the, this entire, uh, just the, the Anders army is, is now a very nice book called The Trail of Hope by Professor Norman Davies. He's still promoting it. It came out just two or three years ago. Uh, he, he's still promoting that book, Trail of Hope. And uh, there he, he describes this entire uh, journey very well. Because before that, this book, Professor Norman Davies told me, you know, read this book. <laughs> that was it, one line answer, you know. If I were you, 
I would read this in the Kaisar, and for the rest you have to open. Kaisar, that and, answers uh, your question. Okay, uh, I think Meera and Anuradha would benefit greatly from talking to each other. Meera's comment sure. is that her father was running from Warsaw in September 1939 towards the east, thinking that he could somehow walk to India, but yes. he was stopped from walking further by the Russian army, uh, Soviet army. So that's I possible think... because now hold on. Now that brings me to another book which I was recommended by Professor Norman Davis. That is. Uh, uh, Slavomir Ravish, The Long Walk to Freedom, where mm -hmm. it seems they have walked from Russia to India. And um, it's semi-fantastical. It has not been established. I did try to help some Polish uh, people who were trying to, you know, figure out where they could have. Uh, they, I really couldn't find any records in, at Barakpur, but, you know, records have gone all over the place. But there is this book. Actually, I'm sitting in my library. <laughs> so this, this has really is, um, become an interactive session when you're when you're talking and actually showing realia. <laughs> yeah, because I, I know, you know, uh, the, the advantage is that I'm sitting in my library, uh, you know, as we are doing this webinar, because at other places, like I have to tell them, yeah, yeah, there is a book like this, you know, and then people think, oh, maybe she's pulling a fast one. So thank you for this interactive session. Then I can actually approach my library and, say, and pull it out of the bookshelf and say, okay, here is a book, you know, I mean, I'm not talking. Uh, I mean, I know what I'm saying. Okay, this one, Long Walk to Freedom. Long Walk to Freedom is uh, Mandela's uh, biography. This is The Long Walk, The True Story of a Trek to Freedom by Slavomir Ravish. Okay. I don't know how, how you are able to get it. Mm. But, you know, this is not a scientific book. So it has been trashed as well. Now I have no clue. Uh, I, 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 no comments on it. Incidentally, the stars on this map are very similar to the logo of Khaki. You would have noticed the stars <laughs> marking all these uh, places. Uh, I just have one last question, and I think it's a slightly unfair question to ask a historian or a journalist. Who was the hero in all this? Is it Kira or is it Jam Sahib? I would say Jam Sahib is the hero and Kira is the heroine. Okay, okay. Because okay. Jam Sahib made it possible by his generous offer. Uh -huh. You know, he, I think that was huge, immense at that, you know. So like a, a father's role or a more masculine role is, he gave a direction to the matter. All right. Mm. If a destination is what you need, my state is yours. So come okay. to India, full stop. But now, how exactly that is going to happen? That is That's Kira. where Kira comes in, okay. Yes, and Kira was largely in Bombay. Okay. So thank you so very much for such a fascinating insight to this lesser known Anna. aspect of our history, so intimately connected with our country and our city. So that was really fascinating and uh, your personal insights and the human interest that you angle that you gave to the talk was really great thank you so much and it's been an absolute pleasure and honor to be with you on this platform thank you a pleasure and thank you for being such a wonderful audience <laughs>